growing up, it's always been track and field. As you know, track and field has been and I think will always be our, pre, you know, our predominant sport, so to speak. Um, you know, so growing up watching the legends like Usain Bolt, Veronica Campbell, which I look up to a lot, and um, Merlin Ati and all those great athletes who paved the way. You know, that was the only sport that we saw on TV that dominated in the Olympics or, you know, bring all that highlight and glory to Jamaica. So that's where it truly really started, so, you know. And then after every time after Olympics, we'd race outside and we'd go on the roads and the, the grass fields and we'd race each other, race my little cousins and all that, race the shops. You know, so that's, that was the foundation and that's when I truly, you know, had a thing for the sport. That's when I, I, I can't say I truly fell in, love, fell in love with the sport back then, but that's where it started. With regards to hurdles, my mom say I always hurdle it. Like whatever is in the way, I'd always hurdle it. Um, and I remember growing up with my little brothers, I'd always like set up like buckets in the road and whatever I could find <laughs> in the road and would race them. Of course, I'd beat them, but I'd forcefully you know, because they always think I'm crazy setting up things in the road to, to, to race over. But um, I'd always do that. I'd always love the, the, the challenge of the sport. And there was just something about hurdling that, that really got to me. And, um, and with regards to when I fell in love with the sport was probably my last year of high school when I broke both national records in the 110 hurdles and the 400 meter hurdles and I ran 49 in the 400 meter hurdles. That was like the defining moment for me. That's when I, I, I truly realized my talent and realized that I, I, can, I can actually have a career with this. And that's when I really fell in love with the sport. So can you talk us through those high school years and kind of where you were and your coaches and that kind of thing and the path for you in high school from starting to this point where you broke those records? Yeah, well, um, I actually went to high school. I went to the Manchester High School first. And, you know, when I went there, I went there mostly for academics. It was uh, an academic school and I didn't take track and field seriously until I was about 15 years old. Um, and then I moved to, you know, that went well. I had, that was like, I can honestly say that was my foundation. That high school, that was where I laid the foundation. You know, set the concrete and everything. That's what, that what started me. That was the base. And then I moved. I wanted a little bit more challenge. I wanted... I, I, and more I'm, the more and more I did hurdling, I'm, the more and more I fell in love with it. So um, I changed high school. I switched high school. I went to Kingston College, the Kingston College, and found a hurdles coach that would challenge me. And, and that was the last year of my high school. And I was like, you know, why not? You know, and just went to have fun. And I really wanted to experience the, the, the championship feeling, you know, because that, that, that was one of the school who was vying for championship. And I just wanted to be a part of I wonder if it. I wonder if like, what would it, what would it be like just to be a part of a you know just to be a part of a school that vies for championship and have that crowd pushing them and I just I just took a blind leap of faith and I went there and it worked out. I mean, tell us more about those Jamaican high school championships because I've as a British man seen yes. them on TV or seen them on the internet they look amazing yeah. but the crowd is unbelievable. Trust me, it's 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 the thing back home. Um, if you can compete at our high school championship, you can literally compete anywhere in the world. Just even if you're not fast, just the adrenaline alone will make you fast. <laughs> to be honest, and just the adrenaline alone will make you fast. So um, that was that's a sol that was always a solid start for us Jamaicans. That that high school championship, you know, is that that's our ticket, somewhat. You know, just to you go through that high school championship, you're solid solidified to take on the world stage. You know, that's it's 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 a thing. It's a thing to experience. It really is. So you, you touched on earlier. You broke both the one ten and the four hundred meter hurdles records. Yes. Like, what was it that made you choose the one ten over the four hundred hurdles? Is it the training? <laughs> Partly, <laughs> but um, honestly, I wanted to go. I wanted to select an event that I loved, um, and I loved even though I dominated the one ten, the four hundred meter hurdles more. I loved the one ten, and I figured you know if I love something, then it's going to be easier. You know, and I, I mean, if I loved the 400 meter hurdles, then the workout would have been easy. Even though it's hard, the workout would have been easy because I loved it, if you get what I'm saying, if you see where I'm going. But I love the 110, and just the, it's a lot more exciting, in my opinion. Um, 
And it's fast. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and who doesn't love fast events? Um, but I loved it. That's where my heart was. So I, I, I selected the one that, you know, where my heart was. And that's why I have the, the success, the, that huge, the huge success that I have now with it, because my heart is there. Mm. And you've, um, I remember you telling us a little bit in Shanghai last year that you had quite an up, uprooting from where you were based initially to train where you are now and mm -hmm. having to leave uh, family, dogs behind. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that and the sacrifices that you made in that respect? It's, it's hard. It was a hard decision. And honestly, I like Usain Bolt, Shelly and Fraser and all those who stayed home. I didn't want to go to the U.S. because I know it was going to be a challenge. I'm a huge family person. You know, and I love my family, and I always want to be around my family. I can always rely on my family. And when you go out and you have a bad day of training and you go home, you can, you're going home to genuine love. You know, you're going home to genuine happiness and people you know that have your back wholeheartedly. So going to the U.S. was, it was kind of a scare, and I didn't want that. You know, but I knew a part of the plan was to go to college. Eventually, I knew I'd have to move on and go to college and get a degree and experience the NCAA life, but mm. honestly, I was leaning more towards staying home. But it just didn't work out that way, so I had to, had to just go after plan B. It was sort of plan B. So can you talk us through, you said it didn't work out at home. Yeah. Like, in what kind of way and how involved your family were in that decision process? It didn't work out in terms of, you know, I was being presented the opportunity to go professional, mm. and I didn't think I was ready for it. That scared me, and that's why I jumped into going to college overseas, because I didn't think, yeah, I ran 49, and you know, when you're on 49, and, and I, I didn't even know that when I ran 49, I ran the same height like the professionals did. You know, I, was, I always thought that, oh, my height is, is, is lower, you know, for the 400 meter hurdles, and come to find out, you know, it's the same height. And I was like, oh, well, okay. And I ran 49, and I knew I wasn't seasoned to continuously run 49. Like I said, at our high school championships, you can run 49 off the adrenaline. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, off pure adrenaline. Yeah, I had, you have the talent and whatever, but just the crowd will push you to run 49. And that was, that was one of my fears, that what if I ran that 49 just because of, you know, the adrenaline? And I was, just, I was just scared I wouldn't replicate that. And I just didn't think I was ready, honestly. I wanted to go into the NCAA and... At first, I wanted to stay home, go to UTEC, one of those colleges at home, and just grow as an athlete. Of course, being closer to family, but when all that pressure came of going pro, and I just, like I said, took another huge leap of faith, and I just went to college. Ended up doing the last SAT, paid the late fee, and just didn't go on no college visit. Mm -hmm. At that time, my best friend Clive Fullen was going to college and going to the University of Arkansas, and I just went with him. No college visits, just got my SAT <laughs> scores and just... Went to Arkansas. <laughs> was, was that quite scary as well, not having, knowing much about where you were going? And was it scary? <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> it was terrifying, not knowing where I was going. First of all, I didn't go on no visit, mm. you know? And, I'm, the, and the scary part was the fact that I'm going here to live for the next four years of college. That was the scary part. Yeah. But when I got there, I knew in the moment that I, I, I'm here. I just have to make it happen. You know, I have to make it. I already sacrificed. I already take made probably the biggest sacrifice of my life to come here, so I might as well just make it happen. So, what were those first few weeks like there? With I mean, it's it's very different from Jamaica. Right? Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. Absolute culture shock. Absolute culture shock. This, you're not going home to your good curry chicken, <laughs> your 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 coast skin soup. <laughs> Me and my stepfather like to call it strong back soup. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the food, um, obviously, you know, you're surrounded by Americans and going to class and having to adjust to a lot of things that was different, you know, and especially in class when I was taking my English classes, you know, I'd, I'd get marked down, which I think was, is still stupid because my, I was British English and some of, my, some of the words I spelled wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd get, my dad would aggravate me, you know, spelling my words wrong. And I, I, it's right, like, you know, I'd like, this is right. It's the British system. I spelled the word, it's not wrong. It's, 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 you know, it's just like, and then, you know, adopting to speaking like them, which, you know, just, just a lot of things were, were different. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of things were different. How, how was it leaving your family behind and, you know, being such a part of a tight knit mm -hmm. kind of uh, group, it sounds like, back yeah. at home? Were you going back regularly? Were you just, Kind of, right, I'm here, I'm here. 
throw myself in. Like, tell us a bit more about that. To be honest, I didn't want to go home a lot, partly because if I had done that, I would probably be back home right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I made it a point of duty and a sacrifice to go home at least once. You know, I didn't want I didn't want to have to get, you know, go home like three, four times and get too attached and go through that nostalgic phase again over and over and over. So it's like, okay, I'm going home once. That should be enough. One time, have a good time and come back for business. <laughs> you know, and yeah. that's how I had to do it. So it was hard, but that's the approach I had to have. And tell us a bit more about the NCAA system. You you, you talked about perhaps not being seasoned enough to run the 49s over and over again. Yes. Before hurdles. It's quite an intense schedule that you have from indoors through to the early outdoor season. Yeah. yeah what was that like moving from your view of not being seasoned enough mm -hmm. before in high school to having that grueling regime? Yeah. Um, it was yeah, like it was a change, and especially for indoors because I do not to this day I do not like indoors. <laughs> I hate every part of indoors. <laughs> you know, and that would be understandable for a Jamaican who don't you know we don't do indoors. We never do it indoors, but. Um, it prepared me, you know, then I became seasoned because, you know, in college, these guys are running professional times and they're running professional times weekend after weekend. So I like the challenge of it. And that made me truly appreciate our sport a lot more. And it showed me a lot. It, it, it just solidified the fact that sporting is about it's it's about challenge and it's about sacrifice and it's about happiness and and bringing people together. And that's what I felt in college. Mm -hmm. That's when I, I, I found out the true definition of sport in general. And it just pushed me to, to work hard. And I just, I spent, I, it took, only took two years of, in college for me to, to, you know, get seasoned. Mm -hmm. And I was ready to go pro because I embraced everything. The old college experience and experience and competing weekend after weekend and getting stronger and faster and taking it all in. So you, you said earlier going pro was terrifying when you for college, Absolutely. and it only took two years then to get to that point yeah. uh, whilst you're in America. Talk to us a bit more about those, the different <laughs> mentalities and um, what, why going pro then was good, mm -hmm. but not before. Yeah, because I mean, you, you, you need time to grow. You need time to experience a lot of things, sorry, <laughs> before you, you go pro. You need time to grow, and um, I, just, I just knew deep down I was not ready. I was not ready, and I wanted to. I wanted to market myself a lot better, and like I said, I just wanted to enjoy life first because I knew I went. I, I went in with an open mind because I knew going pro is not going to be easy. It's not no walkover. It's just easy to say, "Oh, I'm going pro." Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what comes after that? Yeah. You know, I don't want to go pro, and when I go, I know me. When I go pro, I want everything. I'm not going to just settle. I want to be ready to beat guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to pro to, to just, yeah, it's a, it's a process and you get there, but I knew I at least wanted to be ready. You know? What kind of advice would you give to the, the college kids now that are thinking about that, knowing what you went through and, and kind of having the fear factor and then knowing, okay, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. Like, what advice would you give to anyone who's in the NCAA system now thinking about this? Yeah. I'd tell them to be patient and, and wait, you know, wait until you're, you know you're ready. Enjoy the college experience. Train hard. Take it all in. You know, it's a, college is all about team and developing that love for the sport. And you have to have that first. You have to have a foundation before you think about stepping into the pro world. And something is, goes for the high school kids too. I see a lot of high school kids transition and they go pro. And with us pros, if we see a high school kid come, oh, we're not going to let you beat us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like it takes away their confidence. Mm. And that's something I was scared of too. Like me, high school kid, do you think these guys are going to just let me beat them? This is what these guys do to make money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, you have to be ready. Just be prepared. It's, it's, a, it's a fun thing. Being, profe being professional is fun. You're doing what you love for money, obviously, just stating facts. But... You just have to make sure you're ready to do that. <laughs> just make sure you're ready to do it. I mean, in your event as well, it's, it's not one of those events where you all avoid each other. You're week in, week out against the best in the world. Yes. And, 
I mean, what, what's that like pressure-wise? It's a good pressure. It's a great pressure. You know, and I always say pressure is a privilege, and I always say that's what sports is about. It's that pressure. You know, and just the, the challenging yourself, and you know, we see these guys every week. We can only use it to our advantage or disadvantage, and I always use it to my advantage. I know these guys are going to come with their A game every single weekend. So it's my job to do the, just the same, you know, hold myself accountable. And it, it's a good thing because the pressure don't allow you to, to get complacent. <laughs> There's no time for complacency. You know, you have to work and you have to go out there, especially me being the number one hurdler in the world. People want to beat me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I have to work twice as hard. And that's a great pressure to have on yourself. You hold yourself accountable. There are certain things you just cannot do because everybody's trying to beat you. So you, you touched on it uh, a couple of questions ago about wanting to be legendary. Mm -hmm. like, do you consider you've hit that stage yet? And if not, what do you have to do to get that legendary status? I'm getting there. That's a great question. Um, me being great would be just being a hurdler, mm. coming back and winning Worlds next year and winning Olympics breaking the world record, that would be great. Now that would be great. But being legendary would have to be me going out and doing different events and dominating different events or getting medals in different events. And I'd like to say I'm legendary a little, little bit with some of the historic performances that I've had where first hurdler to run nine, sub, you know, sub 10, and I want to be the first hurdler to run sub 20 again, to sub 20, I want to go for 19. So it's getting there. I have a little historic thing behind me, but I'm, I'm still young, so I ain't, I ain't as legendary yet, you know? <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't there yet. Give me until I'm like, give me, give me three more years. <laughs> give me three more years. Just be patient. But yeah, that's what I want to be. I, want, I, just don't want, I don't want to be great. Anybody can be great. I want to be legendary. I want to be remembered. And how long do you think it is now until Aries uh, has to kind of see that world record pass to somebody else? You know what? I'm, I'm training really hard. I know I'm training really hard, and this year is kind of, I'm in the situation where I'm, I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm being patient and I'm watching everybody do their thing. And then I'm just being genuinely supported and supportive and genuinely happy for people, and I'm, I'm just waiting. And I'm like, okay, God, whenever, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. But I just know that I'm, I'm, it's an off year, and it's kind of been off, where I've been challenged with a couple of injuries here and there, and but I know I'm still working hard. The willpower is still there. But I'm just being patient. Even if it takes the last race of the season for me to go out there and do something amazing, or it might not be this year. But I'm being patient. So you said then legendary would be dominating lots of different events. Yeah. And I remember Christine Taylor said in a press conference last year, if he did the triple jump world record, he'd stop there mm -hmm. and then and move to 400. Yeah. If you broke the world record in the 110s, would you stay or would you go to the 400s? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd ask that. <laughs> I knew you'd get there. Um, <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah. Honestly, God knows why he haven't let me break the world record again. Because I honestly can, can say if I break the world record this year, I'd definitely venture off into something. Because it would be like, honestly, let's face reality. It would be like, okay, what's left to do in hurdles? You know, I'd, I'd literally be challenging myself to break world record again and again, you know. So I think that's why God kind of hold it off. We're like, you need something else in hurdles to, to keep you going with hurdles, mm -hmm. you know. So um, four hurdles, <clears throat> absolutely <laughs> not. Don't go there. <laughs> I don't know. Four hurdles is kind of, I hate the training. Mm -mm. And the way Coach Flo's 400 meter hurdle training is set up. Mm -mm. Not no, not, not <laughs> no time soon. But yeah, I definitely if I break the world record, I'll definitely focus and take a year or two just to focus to, to develop in sprinting. Mm. And I have the talent for it, but I know I still have a lot of developing to do and a lot of learning to do in sprinting events. And it was just like if it's just like a hurdler, a sprinter coming to say they're okay. I'm gonna do hurdles at Shanghai. Mm. Say like Andre DeGrasse come to Shanghai. Oh, I'm doing hurdles. <laughs> it's the same concept as like me or her are just going over there and be like, oh, I'm going to beat you guys. Yeah. Oh, no, they're not going to let me beat them easy. Yeah. Like me and Noah Lies was talking about that. And I was like, okay, 
you're gonna have to come good to me, <laughs> you know. So it's just the same concept. So I know I have a lot of growing to do, and it's it's a humbling thing because I'm going into sprints with an open mind. Mm. Do I want to lose? Absolutely not. But I know that it's gonna take me losing a couple races and just giving it my all and growing in the event and learning and you know getting to compete with these guys and see how they run it for me before I become dominant. We have the talent to, right now I'm training, you know, I have the talent to stay with them or beat a couple of them. So I'll be like, if I come seventh and I know I beat one person, I'd be so happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah.